last night that uh, this wasn't working, and my husband tried to gut MacGyver it, and normally it's pretty good, but this one didn't stay. If I could just say one thing to recognize this wonderful woman. She is a speaker today, and I expected her to be in Hong Kong and, you know, coming and just being her little bit. But she was also our greeter, and she was volunteering if anything's ready. So if better than volunteerism at its best, I don't know why it is. So, I think I can speak loud enough. On behalf of the board, and our resident ghost, Kyle and uh, Carlin Fay, welcome to the station here. As long as I've been volunteering here, I've been asked a lot of questions about the building, and I never had the answer. But a few years ago, I was given a document that was prepared by Tom Folks, Terry Watkins, and Ryan Manson, and it detailed the history of this building. So my claim to fame is that I took that document verbatim, added some graphics, added some pictures, and created a book. And that book, there are copies in the lobby and in the mezzanine up above. You're more than uh, welcome to peruse those books on your break. This presentation is an excerpt from that book. So, once upon a time, there was a train station that wanted to be a performance art center. This is the train station story. Maybe not. <laughs> there it is. In 1881, the Ontario and Quebec Railway <coughs> Corporation was created to construct a railway line from Ontario and Quebec, or within Ontario and Quebec. In 1886, the airline was started construction from Toronto to Montreal, bypassing Carlton Place in Ottawa, so that it would be fast and straight, and it would be uh, a division point in Smith Falls, and it would have a new yard and a new station. Oh, I should go this way. In 1887, the first passenger train with CPR uh, stopped off at the newly constructed station theater. Toronto and Montreal were now linked directly via Smith Falls and the prestige of being a division point passed to Smith Falls. The new Montreal airline was called the Winchester Subdivision. In 1931, it, was, it held the speed, uh, speed record for the world's fastest train. Smith Falls being the busiest division point in eastern Ontario, so that every passenger train that originated from the south going to Montreal or Quebec City had to pass through Smith Falls. Special trains that have important people, such as a vice regal card for the Governor General, or had funeral trains for notable, uh, notable people like Sir William Van Horn and Sir Jeremy McDonald, either stopped or passed through Smith Falls. This is one very unusual passenger. In 1936, for two days, Colossus, the 68-ton blue whale, stopped here in Smith Falls. Hundreds of people came to see both the whale and the other marine creatures. In 1945, CPR spent $55,000 to renovate both the interior and the exterior. The building was lengthened to 180 feet by stretching out the lean-to. Bay windows were installed in the waiting room on both the east and the west sides so that they could bring in natural light. There were acoustic ceilings, fluorescent lights, tile floor, and chrome-plated leather padded seats were put in so that the passengers who were waiting for the train could wait in comfort. In addition, in tradition, with the segregation of the sexes, the ladies' sitting room had a Chesterfield, a table set, and a rug so that they could feel like they were still at home. 
The dining room and kitchen area had great changes made to them with all electrical equipment, sandwich and soda counters, and 12 padded foam seats. The dining tables were reduced to three, so that this gave more standing room for the passengers who had to keep and run. Other rooms that were redone at that time were the uh, sitting room for the restaurant employees, the baggage room, and the storage room. The second uh, floor had a major overhaul, and it was uh, put into it was eight bedrooms, two bathrooms, and two sitting rooms. The flat room, flat lined roof with curved corners expressed the modern style, which the CPR wished to evoke. And as a final crown to the project, the station possessed a 20th century monotype header, Canadian Pacific. Aimed towards Daniel Street. With the pressure of the aircraft and the automobile industry, CPR was ready to get rid of its money losing passenger train service. So in 1966, locomotives 1412 and 1903 finished 79 years of CPR train passenger service. The very next day, Canadian National Railway operated its line from Ottawa to Brockville with trains 45 and 46 going through Smith Falls on its way to Brockville. In 1977, the federal government created the government owned subsidiary called Via Rail to take over all passenger train service. VIA continued to use the train station for its passenger service until 2011, when it opened up its new station on Highway 15, thus ending the train station story. However, this was only the beginning. This is the start of the station theater story. In 1999, CPR sold the station to the town of Smith Falls for one dollar. Both CPR and uh, VIA donated $50,000 each to renovate the dilapidated building, which was really considered an eyesore. Otherwise, it was going to be torn down and replaced with a small bus transit like shelter. The Smith Falls Community Theater Foundation was officially formed in February of 2000. There are many people who volunteered and contributed to make this building what it is right now. But I have to mention three because they stood out amongst all the rest. Pat Smith was a retired engineer technologist who agreed to assume the role of project manager and treasurer. For over 10 years, he followed the project from design right through to construction. Now, Pat Smith had a policy. If there was no money, there was no work until more money was founded. As a result, that was never a problem, but it did take 10 long years. And how we put up with everybody whining on that. In 2011, after 10 years of long hours and hard work, Pat left the board and he left the project. The performance center was named the Pat Performance Center to honor his dedication. We also had Wayne Henwood, who was in charge of the sound, the lighting, and the technical aspects of the project. He brought in equipment that was state of the art at the time and actually was some of the best in all of the Ottawa Valley. Wayne also donated equipment, donated our curtains, and a lot of other things as well. The tech booth at the back was named the Wayne Henwood Booth in his honor. Nancy Younger played a major role in fundraising. Unfortunately, I could not find a picture of her anywhere. 
we received four trillion grants for our project, which was almost unheard of. They really, really believed in our project. Some other fundraising activities that went on were the gala dinner, silent auction. There were bus trips to Toronto to see plays like Mamma Mia, Camelot, Lion King, just to name a few. There was revenue generated from the productions that were ongoing at the time, from the billboards that we had outside, seat sales, and also large, many, many donations, large and small, from many people. We also received a summer employment grant so that we could hire students to run summer grandma camp. This not only brought in a little money, but it also brought in a lot more people to the theater itself. Many local businesses and service clubs donated their time, materials, and money. This is how we got to know Tom Folks, who was a major player in our theater. The town council also played a major supportive role, for which we were grateful. 2001. As part of the agreement with CP and the Arrayo, the station waiting theater waiting room had to be renovated first, until such time as they had their uh, terminal constructed on the a, new, a very unique gate, so saw as you came in, was created to separate the waiting room from the theater. Once we had left, this gate has become a very real conversation piece. Unfortunately, with the, that project and the requirement to shore up a lot of the building structure, it consumed most of our initial funding, not leaving anything for the rest of the transformation. I think I missed a slide. In 2002, with a small army of volunteers and additional funding, work was undertaken to clean up the exterior and to build the billboard, which would later be used for advertising. Two thousand and three and beyond. With trillion funding, the real work was about to begin. The first phase of the project was the lobby. While much of the second floor was removed, there was a section that was maintained and stabilized, and that was to be the future place of the circuitry and the lights. The washrooms, the bathrooms, and the bedrooms were all gutted and that was going to be the future home of our costume and storage area. A new, more welcoming entrance was created facing Daniel Street. Volunteers now started the first cut on the green room, on the kitchen facilities, and the lower level. Risers were 140 feet which were used by the NAC and donated, allowed for the installation of the ductwork for the heating and AC systems. All the walls had been framed and with the help of volunteers insulated, the stage was built and uh, spaces were, renovations were made down into the basement to, work, to eventually house a workshop. The theater opened in April 2010, with only the auditorium, the stage, and the lobby having been completed. From 2001 forward, volunteers finalized the green room, the space upstairs above the auditorium to make our costume and prop area. The basement downstairs was cleaned up and dried out so that we could put our stage properties there. Sub pumps and drains were put in. There was a cloak room that was created. The kitchen was finished, and a workshop was put in. So the building was a mess, and there were picture drawings everywhere. 
and there were more structural problems that we even thought about. The tunnel that was uh, bringing the steam into this building caused major moisture challenges, and the fact that the track was so close to us had created very uh, strong noise uh, problems. But despite all these obstacles and the fact that we kept needing more and more funding, the board never faltered, and every time we got money, they kept on working. Senior CPR management have been supportive and have indicated that the heritage of CPR in Smith Falls has been preserved. An eyesore has been turned into a jewel. Many have memories of previous generations in which their grandfathers and fathers worked in the building. So there is a definite linkage between the past and the present. And I can attest to that as well because I have heard so often people say to me, my father used to work here, or my grandfather used to work here, or I used to come here. I think I heard that comment even this morning. And the number of people who come in go, wow, I have never been in here, and this is amazing. In fact, we now have rental people coming to us asking to use this facility, and many of them are weekly performers for their shows and the concerts. We're very proud of this building, hence why we saw a pretty good coffee and tea. I'd like to finish with this poem that I found on the internet. And some of you may even, even know who they refer to. It was a night before Christmas by Anonymous. This is about CPR Smith Falls train crews, Christmas 1991. It was a night before Christmas on the Smith Falls division, the trains they were running without supervision. For TTO Driscoll, the snug in his band, and visions of golf clubs danced in his hand. Monty was working on big Christmas smiles when there came to the station with a clatter and clang. Three forty two hundreds that shuddered and banged. A train for the ramp and conductor Magoo. The hogger, big diesel, the train boom, tattoo. And soon the word followed of Yippie Blair, with Killer just breaking and E. J. McClare. With Problem and JJ and Myron to come, there had to be deadheads on Via with some. But SP is coming and behind him was hard. On big big shining alcoves even pulled and start. As the thoughts of a dead had drifted away, there's a smile from Ray Perry and his mate PA. Then it was Hammer, his hog and Steve Hall. Only was breaking, his stories weren't dull. Yes, freight it was moving this pre-Christmas night, and most of us thought it wasn't just right. Yet this is our job, and they are so few. So Merry Christmas, my mate, our contract is due. Nancy, that was awesome. For our next speaker, we have Catherine Jameson, and she is the Heritage Tourism Manager for the town of Perth. Um, which evolved as the Lanark 
Army Museum Network uh, last year. And before this, I was the uh, curator at Ober Museum in Ottawa and uh, chair of the Ottawa Museum Network. And I should mention too, uh, my role is within the Community Services Department. So today, um, I'll tell you a little bit about Perth. I'm sure many of you are familiar, so I won't do that too long. Um, I'll give an overview of uh, the Heritage Conservation District and uh, a bit of a review of, a plan, of the plan, um, show you, share some of the supporting projects, some of the benefits, and answer some questions as well. Um, so, through the colonization of the unceded traditional Amami Winnie Algonquin land, Perth was settled in 1816 following the War of 1812. Uh, the location was selected to direct people to an unsettled interior through sponsored military settlement. And uh, this first map shows you um, the early boundaries of Perth. Um, the one border closest to me, that's uh, the Scotch Line, and then on the other end is um, the Forest Road. Can't see the book of the here, but I believe it's Northfield on the other side. Um, and you can see Conklin Island in the middle, that's where Town Hall is. And then the map um, on the right, that's um, from Google Maps today, showing uh, the current boundaries of the town so you can see how it's grown. Uh, this map is a little bit later, um, so you can see some of the boundaries of the thing. I really like about this one is it shows uh, the individual buildings which has been handy when we're trying to determine uh, when something was built. Um, so we refer to this one quite a bit when we have it on our wall at the museum. Um, a lot of people think that Perth is all Scottish stonemasons. There are a lot of Scottish stonemasons, but Perth was actually um, named after Perth, Scotland, but includes settlers from um, Ireland and, and Europe as well. Um, much of the downtown, as you see it today, was built in the mid to late 1800s and early 1900s. Uh, for example, the museum where I work is in the Matheson House that was built in 1840. Uh, these are a couple streetscapes to show you um, the downtown now. Uh, the first one is Gore Street and the second is Foster Street. Um, the, the Gore Street photo, the building that's kind of pick, uh, with a little sign that says drugs on it, that one is um, where O'Reilly's used to be, it's now Billings and Company. Um, so the museum is further back behind the trees. And then on Foster Street, you can see um, the Rivera Hotel. That is uh, where Red Fox is now. Uh, these are a couple of modern photos of Perth. Um, they're, they're within the last couple of years, so there's been a bit of change, but Stone Cellar and Hay Design are still there. Um, they're near Town Hall. And then the other photo is of Foster Street looking the other direction. Um, so Maggie's Tea and Toast, I think that's where North Fork is now. Um, but you can see that was a former hotel as well. Um, if you're interested in more Perth history, you can visit uh, perth.ca forward slash tours. Um, there we have um, all of these tours to choose from. The first uh, six or so are uh, ones you can download to your mobile device uh, with a free app called Driftscape. Um, I would encourage you to do that and you can also take your phone um, or tablet uh, around with you while you go on the tours. Um, you can also do them from the comfort of your own couch. Um, the pictures are there, the information is there. Um, of course, I encourage you to get out and visit Perth, but um, if you just want to check it out, you can do that too. And then there's a couple on there that you can download and print paper copies. Um, the, the Print Your Own Walking Tour now has 61 stops. So yes, you can walk it, Perth's not that big, but um, you might prefer to go by bike or by car just to see that many locations in an afternoon. And um, some of them are guided tours. The Stories from the Settlement is a guided tour from Perth Town Crier, Brett McLaren. Um, the Tourism Tour, I give those. Um, the Ghost Walk this week is sold out, um, I'm happy to say, but it's a popular one that we do um, every Halloween. Um, so just a bit of background on the Heritage Conservation District. Um, we hired uh, consultants. Um, who helped us do the first phase, which was completed in December 2011. Um, at that time, the consultants kind of warned us, you know, you may be surprised how many buildings in the area don't fit the criteria. Um, so part of phase one was to determine which buildings uh, were suitable and um, if, if, it was, if it made sense to go forward with the designation. Um, at that time, 
Uh, it turns out that actually 90% of the buildings in the Heritage Conservation District were eligible. Um, and I think the guideline was about 80%. So, you know, through this process, it was determined, yes, we should move forward over the designation. Um, a student was hired as part of phase one. They did uh, research on the buildings, wrote statements of significance of each one. And um, they also did a lot of work interviewing um, business owners and building owners in Perth to get their feedback. And one thing that's kind of interesting about it is that the ratio of the size of the Heritage Conservation District to the size of Perth is um, quite large. It's a large percentage of the town for the, for the district compared to many others. A lot of them have a smaller space and a bigger town, um, so ours is a bit different. Um, they, the consultants also determined through the interviews with the businesses that having the incentive program was a big uh, plus for the business owners. Um, so that they could get some contributions towards the projects on their facades. Um, the first phase was completed in December 2011, and then the, it was fully finished by March 2012. Um, and there was an amendment in May of 2018 uh, to do with paint colors. Um, we had feedback from um, business owners that the paint color part was a little bit restrictive. So that was um, changed in 2018, and it's been um, uh, it's been a lot better and easier for people to manage since then. Um, so these are some of the goals outlined in the plan. Uh, the first one is about the overall district, um, which was uh, you know, about identifying the boundary, encouraging the retention, conservation, and the adaptation of the buildings and attributes rather than demolition or replacement, providing guidance for change so the essential character is maintained um, and enhanced, and identifying the building community awareness for those significant attributes, um, to identify and building those attributes um, and preservation and restoration methods. The second goal is about the buildings in the, in the district. Um, it was decided that we need to establish policies and design guidelines to ensure that development of alterations are sensitive. Um, and based on research, um, we want to strongly discourage demolition and the removal of, of or alterations of the distinctive architectural details um, we want to encourage building owners to really understand the broader context of preservation and see themselves as stewards of their buildings and encourage um, sensitive and restor restoration practices, reversible change, um, complementary changes, and um, provide people with the guidelines and, where possible, incentives. The third goal on the screen is about a cultural heritage landscape. It recognizes that the area includes street patterns, parks, trees, open spaces, um, the Tay Canal, the river, monuments, um, built features that really all contribute to the visual experience of the town. So um, we want to make sure that's all um, planned for and cared for um, up front in advance. And having a replacement plan when necessary, um, like it is now, for example, with Ashbrook Beetle, um, taking down a lot of our old growth trees. Um, there's a plan to replace those over time now. Uh, part of it was also to establish a common language for the elements, uh, fostering an understanding amongst the public and private interests for preservation, and acknowledging that the landscape will endure long after their ownership has changed. We're not looking at the three to five year plan, we're looking at you know, 100 years down the road and, and longer. Uh, the fourth goal is about land use, um, and the last one is about process. Um, so we're talking about ensuring appropriate official plan policies, designations, zoning regulations are in effect, um, establishing policies that will consider and mitigate higher density uses, um, developing site-specific policies and guidelines uh, for special areas that need more consideration, and um, figuring out how to protect key heritage attributes. Um, and the other part of the process is just making sure that everything is streamlined um, and easily understood because that, the easier it is for the building owners and the business owners and the town staff, um, the better chance of success we'll have. Um, so these are the boundaries of the Heritage Conservation, Conservation District in Perth. Um, the black line on the blue and gray map is the boundary. The numbers inside uh, relate to the street address. Uh, just for reference, you might see 80 on the island in the middle, that's Town Hall. And the 11, um, kind of uh, near, near the top, is where the museum and museum parking lot is. Um, and then the green map is just from uh, Google Street View today to show um, what it looks like if you're trying to compare the two, um, what it looks like for the downtown.
Um, so I thought I'd go through some of the main sections of the plan. Um, this one's the heritage character and principles. So basically the downtown first buildings and landscapes reflect key areas of development. There are strong associations between the various elements, uh, buildings, landscapes, business people, and community leaders. The architectural styles and features are reflective of the initial area of development. There is a visual coherence in the area and the building stock um, was a bit at risk at the time, um, just due to a combination of factors, including um, de desirable um, development prospects, um, absentee landlords, um, and just um, a lack of um, oversight. Um, the heritage, heritage character statement focuses on the historic context, architectural character, and streetscape character. And then the key attributes include the association of key businesses with community leaders, the number of well-maintained and detailed buildings from the mid-1800s through the early 1900s, the number of unique buildings, the range of architectural styles, the large number of buildings constructed out of sandstone, the attractive and consistent streetscape, and the Tay River and Tay Canal and associated bridges, basins, parks, and towpaths. Um, we touched on the goals already. Uh, the principles here are adapted from those in the Venice Charter for Conservation from 1964, as well as from Parks Canada's standards and guidelines for the conservation of historic places in Canada. The proposed policies are surrounding development pattern, additions and alterations, new buildings, demolition, site-specific area policies, and uh, private and public realm. Um, you can find the town's official plan at perf.ca forward slash official plan. Uh, the current version was approved in the year 2000, uh, but it's under review now. It wasn't, um, so it was the plan in place when this was being developed in 2011 and 2012. The key goal here is to preserve Perth's built cultural and natural resources while ensuring its growth and prosperity, and to establish the conservation of Perth's heritage resources as a primary element in the plan management of change. The zoning in Perth's HDD includes um, general commercial, institutional, residential third density, and residential fourth density. Um, the site plan and demolition and alteration sections are really about implementing an approval process consistently. The education piece here was a big one. Uh, letters went out, um, information was made available at the library and the museum. A web page was created, realtors were informed, uh, tours were shared and created, and workshops were encouraged. We monitor the number and the type of permit applications, and we strive to collect photos of the work as well. Um, incentives include the heritage grant to contribute to the facade and property improvement as well as various programs which are subject to funding. And I have a handy chart on the next slide that kind of shows what um, does and does not require approval, so I'll show that in a moment. The roles and responsibilities section, uh, that indicates 